It's Wednesday, January 3rd. I'm Priyanka Arabindi. And I'm Juanita Tolliver, and this is What A Day, the podcast that missed you these past two weeks. Yeah, a lot of things went down. I can only imagine the jokes we would have made about the now former staffer who made a sex tape in the Senate hearing room. Oh, yikes. Oh, God. Sadly, we weren't here to make the jokes. We weren't here. (laughs) You'll never know. On today's show, Harvard's president, Claudine Gay, resigned after a conservative campaign accused her of plagiarism. Plus, Disney's earliest copyright of Mickey Mouse just ended, and there's already a trailer for a slasher film with a killer dressed as the character. But first, buckle up, y'all. We are officially in the presidential election swing. And while we are only 12 days away from the first primary competition in Iowa, yesterday, former President Donald Trump filed an appeal to challenge Maine's Secretary of State's decision to bar him from the ballot due to his role in the January 6th insurrection. Yes, okay, I feel like there's been... Definitely some news over the break Mm -hmm. around the same topic. So fill us in. What is going on here? So in the appeal, Trump's attorneys argue that Secretary of State Shanna Bellows has no jurisdiction in the matter and that she should have recused herself due to her previous statements and that she relied on, quote, untrustworthy evidence in making this decision. Now, Maine does have different rules, and the Secretary of State decision is the first step in the ballot process in Maine. In an interview with the Associated Press on December 29th, just after she announced her decision, Bellows backed up her move saying this. I'm mindful that no Secretary of State has ever deprived a candidate of ballot access under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. But no presidential candidate has ever engaged in an insurrection under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I mean, it's pretty straightforward to me. Very. I mean, she (laughs) laid it out. It is open and shut, I feel. But what does this mean for Trump in Maine? Bella stated last week that her ruling was paused pending a decision on appeal. And now that the appeal has been filed, it's in the hands of the Kennebec County Superior Court. State law requires that that court decides the issue by January 17th. And depending on the outcome, we should brace ourselves for appeals to the Maine Supreme Court and then potentially the U.S. Supreme Court. Sadly, another factor we have to consider here is what this means for Bellows as she has faced harassment in the five days since issuing the ruling. Last Friday night, Bellows' home was swatted and her home address was posted on social media. She's also been receiving violent messages targeting her, her family, and her office. I mean, all of the security threats towards the officials who call out an insurrectionist for, you know, being an insurrectionist, are just one more stark reminder that Trump shouldn't be anywhere near the White House ever again. Absolutely. Plain and simple. Over in Colorado, the state Supreme Court there ruled a few weeks ago against Trump being on that state's ballot. But there are new updates on that situation. So give us the latest. What is going on here? This is another case that Trump is likely to appeal. And while he hasn't submitted an appeal just yet, the Colorado Republican Party submitted an appeal to the Supreme Court just last week, and that triggered an extension on the initial stay from the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling. That appeal also means that Trump's name will appear on the ballot unless the U.S. Supreme Court justices decline to hear the case or affirm the state Supreme Court's ruling. In an attempt to get the justices to take up the case, yesterday the Secretary of State, Jenna Griswold, filed a brief with the Supreme Court asking it to decide whether Trump can be disqualified from the Colorado ballot. Similar to Maine, there have been threats made against the Colorado Supreme Court justices who decided this case. But interestingly enough, authorities claim that the armed man who broke into the court building and opened fire yesterday is entirely unrelated to this case. Well, uh, okay then, I guess. Right. Huge pause. Because seriously. (laughs) All right. So how is all of this playing out uh, politically here? Of course, Donald Trump is playing the victim. Of course, he's fundraising off of all of this. And of course, his base of supporters is eating this up. But what I will be watching for is how Republicans and the conservative Supreme Court justices contort themselves around their tried and true notion of let the states decide. You know, that's their favorite line. I mean, when it comes to abortion rights, it's all about letting the states decide. Right. When it comes to gun violence prevention, it's all about states' rights. But I got a hunch that this concept won't apply to Trump in this case, you know? Yeah, very funny how selectively that works. But anyways, thank you so much for that update, Juanita. Great to get the scoop on all of these headlines that we have been seeing. Switching now to the latest in Israel's ongoing war against Hamas. 
Yesterday, the deputy head of Hamas, Saleh al-Aruri, along with two other leaders of its armed wing, were killed in Beirut, Lebanon by an Israeli strike. According to Hamas leadership, seven members of the group were killed in the strike. Senior U.S. officials said that Israel was responsible. The U.S. was informed about the strike as it was happening, so they didn't have prior knowledge. But as of now, Israeli officials declined to comment on this publicly. So what does this mean for the general state of fighting in the Middle East? Yeah, this strike is significant for a few reasons. Of course, it's been Israel's stated goal to eliminate Hamas and the group's leadership from the beginning, but this notably took place in the capital city of Lebanon. Throughout this conflict, the IDF has traded fire with the Lebanese military group Hezbollah on Lebanon's southern border. That fighting has displaced tens of thousands of people in Lebanon, but this is the first time that violence related to this conflict has reached Beirut directly. Many in the international community have long been concerned about this conflict spilling over into other areas in the region. And this strike, which took place in the same part of the city that Hezbollah operates out of, could do just that. In a statement, Hezbollah condemned what they called a, quote, serious attack on Lebanon and a, quote, dangerous development in the course of the war. They are also allied with Hamas. So what happens next here remains to be seen. An anonymous U.S. official told the New York Times that this is likely the first of many covert strikes that Israel will carry out against Hamas officials, many of whom we know are not located in Gaza and are, in fact, abroad. Yeah, and this is also the regional escalation that the U.S. has been working to avoid from jump. So, yikes. Now back to Gaza. What can you tell us about the situation on the ground there? Yeah, so in the time that we last spoke, the humanitarian disaster in Gaza has only grown. According to a new United Nations report, half of Gaza's population of 2.2 million people are at risk of starvation following the onset of the war between Israel and Hamas. A staggering 90% of them have said that they have gone regularly without food for an entire day. Just really hard to even wrap your head around for so many of us who are yeah. listening to this on your way to work or at home. Like it is so far from our reality. Of course, many countries and organizations are offering aid, have been offering aid, but the free flow of that food and those supplies has been limited and subjected to a lot of hurdles by Israel. Officials from practically every leading humanitarian organization have stressed that they have never seen anything like this at this scale and at this pace before. And the tragic reality here is that Israel has been able to enact these hurdles because they're not new, right? Like this type of bottlenecking of resources into Gaza has been policy for years. Yeah. But what about the military operations there? Yes, the Israeli military started withdrawing thousands of troops from parts of Gaza on Tuesday. As of now, we do not know the total number of troops deployed. That hasn't been shared publicly. So we're not able to say, you know, what percentage or how significant this withdrawal is. That is also in part in an effort to boost the country's economy, which actually has lagged as reservists across the country have left their jobs to join the war effort. Some analysts also say that it's the start of a shift towards a more limited and targeted approach. That is one that the U.S. has been pushing for recently. We'll, you know, see if that sticks. According to Palestinian news reports, these troop withdrawals have happened in several parts of northern Gaza, but the airstrikes notably continue. In southern Gaza, the Palestinian Red Crescent Society said that its headquarters in Han Yunus were hit by Israeli shelling that killed at least five displaced people who were sheltering there. The head of the World Health Organization called the strikes, quote, unconscionable. There were a lot of other developments in the area during our time off. Can you get us up to speed on what we need to know now? Yeah, I will do my very best. So most recently on Monday, Israel's Supreme Court struck down a law that was passed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing government that limited the powers of the court itself. This reversal, as well as the law itself, were really big deals in Israel. Mm. The law would have prevented the court from being able to overturn government actions and laws that it deemed unreasonable. And it was one of the only checks on the power of the single chamber parliament, and they wanted to take it away. Allies in Netanyahu's Likud party immediately took issue with this ruling. They said it was, quote, in opposition to the nation's desire for unity, especially in a time of war. But many Israelis were in the streets earlier this year to protest this government's efforts to overhaul the judiciary. And for them, this is a welcome decision to prevent government overreach. Right. 
Also very notably, about a week ago, the New York Times published a large-scale investigation into Hamas's sexual violence during their attack on Israel on October 7th. There's been a lot of back and forth about this for some time now, but in this report, many people spoke about the atrocities they witnessed firsthand against women in Israel. It is an extremely, extremely harrowing read. Mm -hmm. If you missed that over the break, we will link to it in our show notes. We will, of course, continue to follow this story, but that is the latest for now. We'll be back after some ads. This podcast is supported by Marvel Studios Echo. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now, on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's easy to get stuck on how you want to change in the new year instead of what you're already doing right. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can make resolutions stick. Yes, we have told y'all time and time again about the importance of therapy. And trust Mm -hmm. me, you're going to really want your therapy once we hit 2024. So just go ahead and get started right now, okay? Let's do it now because it's looking like a roller coaster, you know? And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to suit your schedule. Just fill out a questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. Celebrate the progress you've already made and that you could make. Visit BetterHelp.com slash WAD today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash WAD. What a Day is brought to you by Skims. Skims is creating the next generation of underwear and bras for every body. And Skims offers a complete system of bra solutions for every need and style designed with the comfiest and softest materials. That was ad copy, but I will say it's a thousand percent the truth. Their bras and underwears are so comfortable. The fabric is buttery soft. It really is fantastic. I have slowly upgraded my entire underwear drawer and I've never been happier. Can agree on the buttery smooth, you know, texture of all of Skims offerings. Absolutely. And Skims bras are now available at skims.com plus get free shipping on orders over $75. If you haven't yet, be sure to let them know that we sent you. After you place your order, select podcast in the survey and select our show in the drop down menu that follows. Let's get to some headlines. Headlines. Harvard President Claudine Gay announced that she would resign her position yesterday, ending her six-month tenure in the position. The calls for Gay to step down initially came after appearing before a congressional hearing about anti-Semitism on college campuses almost a month ago. Remember that University of Pennsylvania President Liz McGill stepped down just days after that hearing. But more than 700 Harvard faculty members rallied to support Gay in keeping her presidency. And yet, the public scrutiny didn't end there, and I'll give you one guess why. Gay's academic career came under fire after conservative quote-unquote activists uncovered several instances of alleged plagiarism in her past work. Last month, Harvard's board investigated the allegations and identified two of Gay's published papers that were missing citations but they clarified that Gay didn't violate the standards for research misconduct. Days later, they found two more examples of, quote, duplicative language without appropriate attribution, saying that Gay would update her doctoral dissertation and request corrections. Ultimately, Gay's decision was explained in her announcement letter, which stated that she chose this path, quote, so that our community can navigate this moment of extraordinary challenge with a focus on the institution rather than any individual. She was the first black president and second woman in Harvard's nearly 400-year history. She returned to the school's faculty as a professor of government in African and African-American studies, but it isn't yet clear when. And sadly, this treatment of black leaders in academia, I think, follows a trend we saw in UNC, uh, Texas A&M, and now Harvard's on this list. And I fear that this playbook is only going to be used again and again to target black academics across the country. 
At least 57 people in Japan are dead after a series of earthquakes struck the western side of the country on Monday, the largest of which was a magnitude 7.6 quake. That death toll is as of our recording time on Tuesday night. The quakes caused a fire and power outages, collapsed buildings, and triggered tsunami warnings and evacuation orders. Tens of thousands of homes were also destroyed, according to Japanese media. Officials continued to search for people trapped in the rubble, and tsunami warnings were lifted yesterday. Officials also warned that more aftershocks and new tsunami warnings could still be in store for residents in the area. Meanwhile, in Tokyo on Tuesday, a Japanese Coast Guard aircraft and a passenger plane collided while landing at Tokyo's Haneda Airport and erupted into flames. All 367 passengers and 12 crew members aboard the passenger flight were safely evacuated within 20 minutes. That is really just miraculous. Right. But five crew members on the Coast Guard plane were sadly killed in the crash. And according to officials, the Coast Guard plane was headed to deliver aid in Western Japan, where the major earthquake struck on Monday. Japan's transport minister said at a news briefing that the cause of the accident is unknown. Now to a couple of immigration stories in Texas. First, the Justice Department has given the Lone Star State until today to refrain from enforcing a new law that would allow state and local police to arrest migrants they suspect of crossing the border without authorization. Emphasis on suspect, right. which translates to racial profiling and racism and all the harmful ways that Latino people will be impacted by that. Like what? Mm-hmm. If the state refuses to do so, the DOJ has threatened to sue Texas to stop enforcement of the law. That's according to a letter sent last week by Justice Department Assistant Attorney General Brian Boynton to Republican Governor Greg Abbott. In it, Boynton wrote that the law known as Senate Bill 4, quote, violates the United States Constitution and, quote, will disrupt the federal government's operations. Abbott signed the law last month and is set to take effect on March 5th. And staying in Texas, the Biden administration yesterday asked the Supreme Court to allow U.S. Border Patrol agents to remove razor wire installed by Texas on the U.S.-Mexico border. The emergency appeal filed by the Justice Department comes after a federal appeals court last month ruled in favor of Texas and ordered agents to stop cutting the wire along the banks of the Rio Grande near Eagle Pass. The Justice Department asked the high court to put that ruling on hold as the case plays out in court. We'll be sure to keep you updated on any developments out of Texas. Yeah, the cruelty is just bigger in Texas, apparently. <laughs> Come on, right? Yeah, I hope the DOJ sues the shit out of Texas for Senate Bill 4. It's really, really just unfathomable what they continue to do Uh because they hate brown people. It really is just that. And I, I want to emphasize the brown people because so many migrants are coming through that border crossing now. And it's not just Latinos. Just to amend my previous reaction, like I'm talking about Haitian migrants, like yeah. anybody else trying to get an access to seek asylum. Yeah. A list of nearly 200 names of Jeffrey Epstein's associates could be released any day now, ending widespread speculation about who the convicted pedophile and sex trafficker kept in his close circle. This comes after New York judge Loretta Preska ordered hundreds of court documents to be unsealed in the case of Epstein's former partner and co-conspirator Ghislaine Maxwell last month. Maxwell was sentenced to 20 years in prison in 2021 for helping Epstein groom underage girls for sex. The Miami Herald newspaper asked the court to reveal the identities of Epstein and Maxwell's associates, victims, or witnesses who were only named as John and Jane Doe's in the official documents. And Preska granted that request, saying that records would be released to the public on New Year's Day. Some of the names on the so-called Epstein list will remain redacted because they were minors when Epstein abused them. And some have already been revealed in other court documents or news reports like Prince Andrew, who resigned from public duties in 2020 after being tied to Epstein and his island. In all, just uh, not a great day to be a terrible rich person, I guess. Yeah. We will see who's on this list. And finally, Disney's copyright on the earliest version of Mickey Mouse expired in the U.S. on New Year's Day, meaning that everyone is now free to use the character in their work without repercussions. To be clear, Disney says it still owns the rights to Mickey as a corporate mascot. The version of Mickey that's up for grabs is from the 1928 short film Steamboat Willie, which entered the public domain on January 1st. Yeah, I had to (laughs) stifle a laugh that was creeping out there. (laughs) Just hours after it was official, two companies dropped trailers for their own scary spin on the beloved mouse. 
a group of independent filmmakers dropped a trailer for a low-budget Mickey Mouse horror movie called Mickey's Mouse Trap. Where the hell did he go? <laughs> what? I'm sorry. No, this is a family-friendly character. I hate it. I hate it. <laughs> So in it, a man wearing a Mickey mask corners a group of mediocre actors in an empty <laughs> arcade with the tagline, quote, the mouse is out. Jeez. <laughs> Meanwhile, a new horror video game featuring Mickey Mouse was also announced on New Year's Day called Infestation Origins. They're everywhere. The exterminators are our last hope. Please, help us before... Uh, that sounds really questionable. It's giving Call of Duty? Like, I don't understand. Even less appealing. No. Right? <laughs> the trailer for the game follows the story of a rat outbreak seemingly caused by Mickey himself, and the player must find a way to survive the vermin before time runs out. Again, highly questionable. No, I live in New York City. I don't need a game of that. That's just my real life. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. But Mickey wasn't the only character released from Disney's copyright on January 1st. Tigger of the Winnie the Pooh franchise was also released into the public domain on Monday along with some of the company's other 1928 works. Maybe we'll see him in a rom-com by Valentine's Day. I'm actually not opposed to that idea because Tigger was friendly, lovable, adorable. I would love to see Tigger find love. Listen, this is what we want and what we get is like a Tigger slasher film. So... <laughs> I don't know. If someone out there can actually give the people what they want, that would be appreciated. Otherwise, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to be anti all of this. Also, if you're going to do this, invest the money. Right. Get some production value. Seriously. What we heard from Mickey's mousetrap sounded awful. Like, put some money behind it. This is amateur hour. <laughs> I'm not into it. And those are the headlines. One more thing before we go, 2024 is here, and this year, turn your resolutions into actions with Vote Save America. After a much-needed break enjoying the people and things you love, now is the time to get involved and help make the difference you want to see this election year. From down-ballot races to the fight for the White House, you have the power to bring the progressive change that we need, so head to votesaveamerica.com to be the first to find out how you can take action in 2024. That's all for today. If you like the show, make sure you subscribe, leave a review, get fired up for 2024, and tell your friends to listen. And if you are into reading and not just the list of everything else that's now public domain like me, What A Day is also a nightly newsletter. Check it out and subscribe at crooked.com slash subscribe. I'm Priyanka Arabindi. I'm Juanita Tolliver. And, and Wad Squad 2024. 2024. I feel like a Power Ranger. Like, are we supposed to level up? Like, what, what's supposed to happen? I, yeah, explosions. <laughs> Do I, like, put my hand up? I don't know. I'm into it, though. I feel like this could be, this could be our best year yet. What a Day is a production of Crooked Media. It's recorded and mixed by Bill Lance. Our show's producer is Itzi Quintanilla. Raven Yamamoto and Natalie Bettendorf are our associate producers. And our showrunner is Leo Duran. Our theme music is by Colin Gilliard and Kashaka. Hold up. 